And that is where we begin our journey. Hello and welcome to Journey to the Sea, the new Vandals Let's Play series. Gorogisil, King of the Vandals, and his second-in-command, Visimar, set out westward from the lands of Pannonia. In accordance with the minor victory conditions, we'll be traveling west overland through the Roman-held territories of Western Europe toward the Iberian Peninsula as we compete with other barbarian factions who are also on the move for land and resources. In accordance with the cultural or military victory conditions after settling in Iberia, my intention is to cross the Strait of Gibraltar into northern Africa. I hope this will give us a strong position to wrest control of the Mediterranean Sea and perhaps one day assault Rome itself. As the Vandal people have been settled for some years in Pannonia and now move into uncertain lands, we have no need to cultivate our civic knowledge at this time, but rather we will invest in military technologies that will allow us to improve our armies and fighting prowess. Examining the family tree of our faction, we see that Gudajisal has two teenage sons, the half-brothers Genseric and Gunderic. He also has an adopted daughter in Gunthus. According to his personal traits, Gudajisal is an irritable, fretful man of 42 years, the burden of command apparently having made its mark upon him. His young wife is a priestess, which helps us to spread the true faith of Arian Christianity in the land of Nicene heresy. Genseric, the illegitimate son, is 16 years old and has an excellent grasp of fiscal matters for such a young man. In spite of his personal humility, I expect great things from him one day. Gunderic, his legitimate half-brother, is also 16 years old and is by far the better looking of the two. The other Vandal clan noble of importance include Indulf, a young statesman of 32, he is a soldier with a knack for skillful defense and could one day prove an effective general. Finally, Visimar is Godegisel's second in command and currently leads half the Vandal people in a migrating horde. He's 50 years old and his wisdom is evident as he has the personal trait Sage, which increases our research rate faction-wide. Not surprisingly, his knowledge includes a thorough understanding of war and we can see why Gotojisil has placed his trust in this man. Examining the diplomacy panel, we see that most of the factions are either neutral or hostile, My with the friend, only friendly factions being be the Alans, our longtime allies, the and the Bestarnians. We also have a tenuous you. alliance with the Subians. The Alani king Respendiel offers his daughter Mata in marriage to Gotojisil's son you in order to strengthen us. our alliance, they and I agree to the proposition unconditionally. Away. The friendly Bastarnians also agreed to a non-aggression pact. I considered marrying off Godegisel's adopted daughter to the Subians to strengthen our ties with this faction, but given her innate cleverness trait that would prove very beneficial to a future husband, I decided to keep her in the faction. On the campaign map, we see the Roman frontier to the south and west, and the hostile Alemanni walled settlement of Urbursus. Godegisel orders Visimar to march into Roman territory, which he does, moving the children of the forest and their accompanying migrating civilians to the outskirts of the unwalled settlement of Ayuvavum. He encamps the horde there and orders immediate improvements to the encampment's industrial capabilities since most of our infrastructure was lost or left behind in the Great Migration. Odegisil and his horde, the Oath, also head south and encamp, and he also commissions improvements to the industrial capabilities of his encampment. Both hordes also recruit an additional unit of cavalry. I already have the capability to recruit a spy, so Godogisil hires a young man named Fridabal who should be able to infiltrate the enemy and for now at least be able to slow their movement so our hordes may escape some potentially dangerous encounters. In the future, I hope he'll be able to do much more. At this point I end the turn and Visimar awaits the response of the Roman garrison at Ayuvavum. Although most of the activity taking place in the intern phase is outside of our field of view, we receive word that several factions have declared war on the Western Roman Empire, including the Caledonians, the Franks, and the Yazyges. Additionally, we find that two Eastern factions, the Sclavians and Budinians, are now at war, perhaps fighting over some scrap of territory not yet despoiled by the Huns. Fridabal scouts the settlements of Uberzus and Augusta Vindelicorum, finding a relatively strong Alemanni force encamped at the former, but a considerably weaker Roman legion within the walls of the latter. 
However, the composition of these forces remains a mystery for the time being. Meanwhile, Visimar reaches the Roman outpost of Iuvavum. We join the growing number of factions declaring war on the Western Roman Empire and are in turn joined by our allies, the Swabians and Alans. Visimar assaults the Roman settlement at Iuvavum, and with such a weak force defending, I decided to just auto-resolve this battle. The children of the forest crush the small Roman garrison and Visimar's orders are carried out. All of the Romans are killed. Although all of the Roman dwellings and possessions are plundered for the horde, the settlement itself is not put to the torch, nor are its people molested. The liberated Illyrians gratefully accept an offer of alliance. So Dagesel and the Oath move into the newly liberated Illyrian territory and encamp there. Visimar marches further south into Roman territory, where his horde sets up camp near Virunum. Odogisil worries that the Alamans may take advantage of the escalating armed conflict with Rome to strike at the Vandals. He believes they can be subdued only by striking at their heavily fortified city of Obersus, so the craftsmen of the Oath continue to improve their industrial capabilities, laying the groundwork to build siege engines. We've apparently now made contact with the Saxons, and they seem friendly, perhaps simply since we share the Romans as a mutual enemy. You honor us. Although they readily agree to a non-aggression pact, they initially balk at an offer of defensive alliance. I agreed to share some of the spoils of our recent conquest in order to secure the alliance, and a moderate sum was sufficient to buy Saxon loyalty for now. The Franks also Good agreed to a non-aggression pact, but were mistrustful of an alliance. During the intern phase, a small Roman force from Augusta Vindelicorum ventures into Iuvavum. I thought initially to launch a vain counterattack on the settlement itself. However, they are reinforced by a garrison from Virunum, as well as a small, previously unknown army from further southeast, and from the northeast by the Magister Militum himself, Flavius Stilico. Narrowly avoiding a trap, Visimar and the children of the forest flee southeast. However, the respite is temporary as a small force commanded by Vettius Pretextatus cuts off our escape and enables the larger force commanded by Stilico to advance on our position. Visimar has no choice but to turn and fight. However, it was whispered by soldiers across the empire that Flavius Stilico became complacent when holding a strong advantage. We encounter the Roman army in an area of sparse forest and hills. We have somewhat of a high ground advantage already. I've concealed the bulk of my forces in a small copse at the foot of the hill. My Sarmatian spears and their war dogs are deployed on the right hand flank along with the cavalry. Enemy reinforcements have been spotted. The enemy has been sighted. As my spears crest the ridge, the enemy force comes into view. You can see the smaller attacking force of Vedius Pretextatus in the distance, his elite bodyguard accompanied by regiments of swords, spears, cavalry, and javelins. Although this smaller force poses no great threat, Flavius Stilico's army is already moving in from the right side to reinforce. Although I would like to have maintained my high ground advantage, I did not want the enemy to unite their forces, so I send my men running down the hillside, and my cavalry advance on the right. The Sarmatian spears move into the forested area off to the right to wait for a flanking opportunity to present itself. I conspicuously send a unit of my Germanic mounted warband cavalry sweeping left in front of my main force through the small wooded area above Vidius Pretextatus's force and snaking around to the left at the foot of the hill. The 
The remaining two units of Germanic mounted warbands swing wider to the right and halt at the top of the small hill. The threat of a rear charge from the cavalry on the left has been sufficient to hold the spears in place and away from the remainder of my cavalry, while at the same time I have cut off Vedius Pretextatus from Stilico's reinforcements. With the enemy general exposed in this way, I give the order for a cavalry charge directly at the general's bodyguard and the adjacent javelins. In the charge and the ensuing melee, my cavalry units inflict heavy casualties on the enemy units and cause their morale to begin dropping precipitously. He moves his cohorts in to support the general as the javelin men begin routing. The enemy light cavalry begin moving around the engagement in a flanking maneuver. However, by this point the Roman javelins have broken and a unit of my cavalry is free to preemptively charge the scout equites. Meanwhile, my third unit of cavalry have outmaneuvered the Roman spears and are able to execute a devastating rear charge on the enemy swordsmen. Although the enemy begin wavering as the casualties pile up, their morale is restored as the spears finally arrive, driving off one unit of my cavalry. Unfortunately, as the engagement wears on, my cavalry are continuing to suffer losses of their own and Stilico's reinforcements are now getting dangerously close. Just as I'm contemplating pulling back, the enemy general's bodyguard waver and then begin to flee. Vidius Pretextatus is cut down in the pursuit. With their mission accomplished, the cavalry withdraw to the safety of the woods, where they are pursued by a single unit of swordsmen. Riders ready. Mounted Again I split my cavalry and the swordsmen are rapidly overrun by charges from all sides. <laughs> After a short and bloody melee, the Roman cohorts are shattered, and my cavalry pull back toward my main force as Stilico's army has several units of spearmen and as many cavalry as I do. My infantry line up in the open field and begin advancing to engage Stilico's army head on, with the odds now more even, if not completely in my favor. However, with just a few volleys of arrows for my archers who are skirmishing in front, the Roman resolve is already starting to weaken as several units are wavering, having seen Vettius Pretextatus ridden down right in front of them. Roman cavalry are moving in on both flanks. On the right side, they become distracted by the barking of warhounds in the woods. However, it's too late as I set the hounds loose on them and move in with the spears. Both units of Roman cavalry quickly rout and are pursued by the dogs. My cavalry support the left flank by preemptively charging the single unit of scout equites moving in on that side. They quickly rout the enemy, although one unit of mine also breaks, albeit temporarily, and subsequently rallies. In the center, the opposing front lines clash, which are composed almost entirely of spear units. The axe-wielding second line vandal warband move in to support our spearmen and the Roman cohorts do likewise. However, the Romans are able to stand up to the axe units for only a few seconds in their demoralized state until a mass rout commences in the center of their force. 
Although a few units of Roman infantry valiantly continue to fight on the left, the line on that side is held by Visimar and his bodyguard until a unit of Germanic warband can move in to support. A Vandal victory becomes a foregone conclusion at this point, and all that's left is to ride down the shattered remnants of the Roman force. The remainder of the battle is a massacre. Visimar earns himself a heroic victory, although I've suffered some heavy losses in the engagement, losing over 700 of my own men. Although Flavius Stilicho himself was rumored to have been killed, his body has never recovered. Dead or alive, his influence with the Roman Senate is likely destroyed, and he poses no further threat to us. He may have returned to Rome in disgrace to face the consequences of his failure to retake Illyria. It's now back to our turn, and we seem to have turned the situation on its head, as we have the now decimated Roman army caught between our forces. I'll leave the story here for now, but there will be more to follow. Thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed this episode of March to the Sea.